Hi there, and welcome to the podcast this week. I am Mark Zinkowitz, and it is April 30th, 2020. Going to try something a little bit different this week. I've gone back into the archives and found a couple of interviews that I hadn't had a chance to release yet. These were both done in Monterey, California, back in February at the American Seed Trade Association's Vegetable and Flower Seed Conference. That was just a few weeks before the COVID-19 pandemic hit the Western Hemisphere. If you've been listening to the podcast these last few weeks, you'll know that there's a huge demand for vegetable seed right now. Both of these interviews with Andy and Jan touch on the topic of vegetables and consumers specifically. First up, I will interview Andy Levine. He is president of the American Seed Trade Association. After that, you'll hear an interview I did with Jan Branco. He is vice president of produce sourcing for Sobeys here in Canada. Enjoy! One quick housekeeping note before we begin. In my interview with Andy, I referred to him by mistake as Executive Director of the American Seed Trade Association. He's actually President of ASTA. Just wanted to note that. Hi, I'm sitting down with Andy Levine, Executive Director of the American Seed Trade Association. Andy, thank you for sitting down with me. Thanks, Mark. Great to be with you today. What's a little known fact about Andy that something not many people know about you? That's a tough one. I'd have to say uh, I grew up in a military family. I didn't grow up in agriculture. My dad was in the Air Force and he flew and moved all over. And I got into agriculture because of uh, taking the issue for the congressman I worked for, for from Florida. Wow, so that's kind of, a, I guess, a little bit of an indirect way, I guess you could say, of, of getting into the industry. But I'm encountering that a lot uh, today. I spoke with someone earlier who, before they got into agriculture, wanted to design uh, rockets for space. And so there's all sorts of people in this industry who don't necessarily have uh, farming backgrounds or, or agriculture backgrounds. I happen to be one of them. So in a way, I suppose it can, uh, it, it can help you to come into an industry uh, with, without prior experience because it might maybe give you a little bit of a, maybe a fresher perspective perhaps. Yeah, I think it gives us that perspective sort of from the side. You know, it's not, the, I would say the normal, but it's not of growing up on a farm where you're so focused on production and agriculture. Uh, coming into it, you're looking at it from uh, uh, an, uh, sort of an outsider's view in all of the things that go into production and people's perceptions. I come in with a completely different perception of somebody who grew up in it. So it's pretty refreshing from that standpoint, but uh, what a wonderful industry to work in. And uh, when we look at everything from the diversity of production in the Midwest to what we see here in California in the Salinas Valley and up in Woodland and Davis, it's, it's an incredible uh, industry to work with. Now, this is the 59th annual Flower and Vegetable Seed Conference. Is there anything particularly uh, new or exciting this year for you personally about this event? Well, this year we're, we're going to top the 1,000 participant mark, and we continue to grow, I think, because the not only the domestic produce marketplace sees this as a, a key uh, meeting to attend, the international one does as well. When we're close to production areas, seed production areas here on the West Coast, uh, one year and then next year we'll go to Florida and we're close to production and research in Florida, that's really helpful. Uh, this year we have some uh, great participants from the retail community that will be with us on uh, Monday and that's, that's great. We're, we're going to that end consumer of what are they looking for. And then we're also talking about what is that farmer of the future looking for for the seed uh, salesperson or the seed industry and in research um, and that's going to really help the industry grasp where we're going and what that future looks like. Well this is a big conversation that I seem to be having with people more and more often these days is this idea of of the end user and catering to the end user and uh, thinking I guess beyond uh, quote-unquote simple commodity agriculture and thinking about those those end-use customers and and what they desire and and do you find that too is this a conversation that you're having more and more often now it really is mark uh whether it's talking to walmart or kroger or uh, monday it'll be church brothers or taylor farms here uh, a duda and sons they're looking for what is the breeding community 
uh, potentially bringing to market and what do they need in a lot of cases they need issues uh, taller lettuce in order to harvest by machinery instead of by hand because the labor is so tight they're looking for disease and pest resistance they're looking for size and taste and flavor it's not just the, the, the grower that's looking for that it's the consumer Walmart wants to know what's new and different Kroger wants to know what's new and different so they're coming to the source and we're opening that door and say come on in and let's talk and let us help we realize, though, that they have to help us carry the message about plant breeding. We haven't had to talk about it a lot, but now the consumer wants to know. Yeah, it's a real shift. Uh, consumers, I suppose, have more, I guess, I don't want to say control, maybe more influence than they've ever had on, on what products are, are available. And so on, on the one hand, that's really great and that's really, uh, really exciting. But on the other hand, it presents a, a big challenge for the seed industry to maybe, I, I suppose, try and change some of these paradigms, some of these ways of thinking that maybe we've gotten used to over the years and that, that, that now we have to, to sort of reverse that a little bit and realize that, um, that the consumers really have a lot more, I guess, a lot more power than they've ever had. They have, and I think we, with technology and social media and all of those other factors that come into play, that attention span's a lot shorter. And how do we deal with communicating very complicated, difficult issues of genetics and plant breeding and all of those things that we do and we take for granted? The consumer wants to know, how did you create this beautiful strawberry or this grape tomato or anything in the produce section we got to be willing to tell them we got to be willing to open the door open the the, uh, the field gate and say come on in let us talk to you about how we got here and what this means and how plant breeding is evolving so how does that change your job well what we do is we try to identify the uh, people in the industry who are willing to, to speak to any audience whether it's a produce buyer's audience or whether it's a grower group, uh, any, anything along those lines. Uh, like today, we had the Produce Marketing Institute uh, Association excuse me, here with us, and they'll be with us for a couple of days to talk through the innovation that we have and where their interests are. So we've got to find those um, opportunities to bring the industry out to the correct communities. We are working very closely with public breeders from our land-grant institutions and from USDA to have them help tell the story because they're doing a lot of the discovery. They're also educating our, our, our future plant breeders and geneticists and farmers so that they can use technology and innovation as it changes. And so it's important that they play a key role. So we're trying to make those connections that are unusual. We haven't had to do this in the past. and so. What's great is we, we just have some wonderful young people coming out of college, uh, uh, young men and women who are PhD geneticists or breeders or uh, statisticians that are really passionate about what they do, and they're the best ones to tell the story for us. And so that's what we're doing, Mark. We're trying to link the story with the right audience. Well, and I guess that's what uh, what learning is, is doing something you've, you've never done before, right? It really is. And... The other part of it is really tying the storytellers to the regulatory community. Uh, FDA, USDA, EPA, they've seen it from the transgenic or the GMO standpoint, but they really have not seen plant breeding and how it's evolved. They haven't had to look at that. And so we're trying to really help communicate where plant breeding is going to that regulatory community so they're comfortable with what they're doing, what we are doing, and that they don't have uh, any apprehension about that or concern. Well, I am here on the trade room floor at the American Seed Trade Association Flower and Vegetable Seed Conference in Monterey, California, and I am with Jan Branco of Sobeys. Jan, can you tell us what you do at Sobeys and a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so uh, my, my role at Sobeys is a Vice President of Produce Sourcing, so essentially overseeing the sourcing operation, uh, the buyers from across the company, across our, our regions and within Canada. I also oversee the quality control personnel uh, across our um, warehouses, um, and uh, we also have people uh, on the ground, so boots on the ground, so field guys working directly with uh, vendors. So why do you come to an American Seed Trade Association event? What are you looking for? How does this benefit Sobeys? 
essentially the reason why I'm here today is to build some relationship with key breeders from from around the world and the goal being to be in the known uh, so to speak of what's coming down the pipeline and what they're working on and also initiate some strategic relationship with them and so we can work together on on you know obviously innovation but also gaps that we may be having today in, in our uh, portfolio uh. as someone who's literally on the hunt for new types of produce that Sobeys can sell to its customers what what interests you and what have you heard so far here that that's coming down the pipe that that you think has some possible potential I think if I had to, to use like one word to describe what I'm on the hunt for is taste you know tasty tomatoes tasty melons cantaloupe especially right so because I think the the industry in general will will agree that that the melons uh, there, there's an opportunity to improve the cantaloupe as a whole right so so that's the kind of the discussion I've been having with the many of the breeders this morning. Yeah, that's a big topic right now. I was at a conference not long ago where they were specifically talking about cantaloupe and bringing the flavor back mm -hmm. to a lot of this produce because as we've as we've bred with yield in mind, I guess we've maybe forgotten a little bit about flavor while that's right. happened. So now there's a discussion, okay, how do we maintain yields and even increase yields but maybe bring the flavor back? Some people say that that's not easy and in fact might not be possible that if you want to return the flavor to your produce, be it a melon or what have you, that there may have to be some yield sacrifice. And I know there's, there's been programs to, to work with growers to, uh, to help compensate growers for maybe taking a little bit of a, a yield hit in order to produce a more flavorful cantaloupe, for example. What, what potential do you, do you see there and, and is, is Sobeys working on anything like that at the moment? Uh, nothing specific. Um, however, uh, there there has been program in the past where we 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 understood that there's a premium that you need to pay, and uh, and we we surely understand that. Um, and it's it's all about balance, I think. And 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 you're absolutely right because it's it's very difficult to get yields, taste, and also the price point after, right? So you, it's it's a give and take, right? So very difficult, but but we're certainly open to uh, to that discussion. Uh, if if we feel that the product that we're getting is is uh, really offering an amazing customer experience, right? What's your favorite vegetable or fruit, and and why? That is a very good question because I like uh, like uh, a lot of fruits and vegetables. But I would say um, stone fruit in general, or I really like uh, stone fruit, especially here, the ones that are coming from California. If you if you go in the valley, there's um, um, several growers doing a great job, and there's so many trials happening, and there's so many varieties um, that are coming down the pipeline that are amazing. So it's 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 a an exciting time for stone fruit. Uh, Where are you originally from? I'm originally from Montreal, the South Shore of Montreal, but I did live here in California for four years uh, before I came back to, to Canada in 2016. And what, what attracted you to the produce industry? Why do you why do you like doing doing what you do? Why do you enjoy working with produce? It's it's a great question actually. I, I fell into it when I was young because my dad has been you know, in agriculture uh, since since I was born. So I, I literally spent part of my childhood growing up on a farm. So so I was really exposed to produce uh, all of my life. So you've been connected to it from, from the very beginning? Absolutely. How does that help you in your job to have that experience right from when you were a child? Having that background, how does that help you in, in your work today with, with Sobeys? You know, and it's maybe an unexpected answer, but um, appreciation, right, of like all the artwork that the growers are putting into the land and their farm every day. And I fully understand the challenges that they're facing, and uh, and and often as a retailer, you don't appreciate enough under the the opportunity that you have to to showcase your product on the uh, on, on your shelves. So. 
that's really that's really the I would be, say that the main thing, right? And then that uh, for me, what it means to be in produce. Right? Well, I think that would be important for a large company like Sobeys to have somebody like you there, in literally in the fields, working one on one with these growers and and understanding their work and what they go through and how challenging it is for them and that would be a real benefit for for them and for you and and for Sobeys as as a whole I would think just to be able to to connect with them and really understand their needs and and what what they need in order to uh, to produce some of these new new varieties that that you end up selling to customers absolutely absolutely and you know it was, uh, the, the local aspect as you know you, you will appreciate this being Canadian uh, for, for us being a Canadian company is very important and, and local is a, a key pillar right for, for, for the company uh, and we work with local growers from across the country uh, at various level which is which is awesome and totally the right thing to do right because it's, it's sort of giving back to the community that, that you're in right so. thank you so much for your time oh it's been a pleasure thank you very much Thank you so much for joining me this week. For more great podcasts, visit germannation.ca.